Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Ask Katie Anything. I'm your host, licensed marriage and family therapist, Katie Morton. I'm so glad that you're here. In today's episode, I'm going to talk about if there's anything that we could be doing that are causing people to constantly trauma dump on us. I'm also gonna get into why we can feel at our worst in the evenings and my thoughts and personal experience um, dealing and utilizing, I guess, internal family systems or IFS therapy. I'm also going to give you some ideas and tools on ways to get out of a depressive episode and how to deal with codependency and friendships. And finally, we're going to talk about how we can actually feel our feelings. Without further ado, let's jump into this first question. This question says, Dear Katie, I hope you're having a good day. I am. I hope you're having a good day. It says, I'd like to ask if there is anything I do that makes people think they can trauma dump on me. I grew up as my parents' therapist and feel like my friends do the same thing. Also, no one ever seems to care about how I am. I've been depressed and struggling with passive suicidal ideation and eating disorders. I'm obviously tired and struggling, but no one bothers to ask me about what's going on. Am I doing something wrong? And what can I do? Thanks for your help. I love this question because it not only applies to this situation, but to so many situations. Let's get into it. Now, when someone says that they find themselves in similar relationships with their current friends, uh, romantic partners that they found themselves in when they grew up, automatically I'm like, oh, the roles are the same and you're most comfortable with those people. Now, hear me out. I know a lot of you might've just thought, no, but I'm not comfortable. I don't like it but we're used to it. And the one interesting thing about our brain is that when we kind of know what to expect, meaning if I'm used to the fact that if I, uh, I don't know, if I let someone down, I get yelled at profusely. Let's say my parents were extremely emotionally abusive. Now I grew up and I hate it. I feel like I'm walking on eggshells. I never really know exactly how to act. Oh, it makes me like super, super anxious and maybe highly sensitive. And I think I cannot wait to get out of this house. I want to have different relationships. I want to feel different. I want to have people who actually respect me. But then we go out into the world and the people who are kind and loving feel weird, maybe a little dangerous. We're not sure what they want from us. Hmm, We're suspicious. And the people who treat us the same way our parents did, even though we hated it, we're used to it. Feels comfortable. I know what to expect. And I know that's hard for a lot of us to digest, but When we grow up in a certain kind of way with certain types of behaviors around us, that's the blueprint that we go out into society with looking for other people that match that blueprint. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't get in therapy, understand the unhealthy dynamics, change the blueprint and go out. But for a lot of us, even myself included, like I didn't recognize my own dysfunction or my own like people pleasing urges and the things that I don't like about myself. I didn't notice that until I was in my mid 20s. And so I could have and did have some romantic relationships and friendships that catered to that old version of me. And so to get back to this question, why do people trauma dump on me? Am I doing something? You're not doing anything specifically, but you are choosing people that are similar to your parents. And that's because you were a parentified child. Like you said, you grew up as your parents' therapist. And so you're used to the dynamics of friendships and relationships in general, where you're the quote unquote adult in the room, or you're the one they go to with their problems. And the only way out of this, or the way to not do the thing that you're doing, I don't like to say that you're doing something because that sounds like victim blaming in, in my brain. Instead, I want to say that we have a certain pattern of behavior that we don't like. And in order for us to have different relationships, we have to change that pattern of behavior. And the first thing that I'd have you do is start setting boundaries. And that's going to be horribly, horribly uncomfortable for you. And the way that I would encourage you to go about this is not to start talking about them yet. We're not there. Right now, I'd like you to start assessing your relationships and assessing how much sharing you feel is okay for you and how much sharing you would like to do yourself. Let's just start taking stock of how we feel in our relationships. And if we find a relationship is extremely toxic, like they never ask us how we are. If we start telling them how we are, they don't really care. They only call us when they need something. We can never get a hold of them. 
when we need anything. Are those relationships worth staying in? And if they are, or if we want to try, what would we want to say to them? Or what actions would we want to take to let them know that, hey, that's enough, kind of. Like, there's our boundary, right? And these boundaries will be things like, you know, I'm not always going to be reachable for them because I find that then when I reach out to them, they're not available. So can I try reaching out to them? And then, you know, if they don't get a hold of them, they can call and they won't get a hold of me. How often do I want to be available? How much or how much time am I going to dedicate to, you know, being there for them while they tell me everything about their life? When am I going to speak up and say, me too, I'm going through X and start change the conversation. Like a normal, and I know for some people, they might be like, Katie, that seems really rude and you can't be there for other people. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying in relationships, there's give and take, there's balance, right? In a healthy conversation with a close friend, let's say they're going through a tough time, they share about what's going on. And then there's probably a period of time, maybe 10 minutes in or maybe longer, depending on what they're what's happening, where they're like, Ugh, enough about me. I'm sick of talking. What's happening with you? And they really care and they listen and they let you share. And if a friend isn't doing that, it's okay when there's a, a pause in the conversation, when they're talking, you can say, oh, that reminds me of this that's going on in my life. And we change the subject to ourselves. And I would encourage you all to try doing that, not to always run the conversation and be the only one that talks, but have this give and take, this ebb and flow. I encourage you to try that and notice if this friend or romantic partner allows for that shift. If they let you talk and ask follow-up questions. Because what that tells me then is that they didn't realize they were only focusing on themselves. But when you talk and when you share, they want to hear more. But if they pull it right back to themselves, if they say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, anyways, and they go back into their own story, that tells you that there isn't space for you in that relationship. And you might want to consider if the level or the deepness of that relationship needs to continue. And that's all for you to decide. That's something that you get to, to figure out what feels good for you. And this might mean that we start new friendships or we find new people who are, are more giving, are more balanced, because unfortunately, when we grow up with a certain kind of parent and a certain kind of dynamic, we go out into the world and look for it. And we end up finding people who have that opposite dynamic and they're comfortable with us. They're comfortable always being the center of attention. And so these things can shift. It might take some time. Don't expect them to you know, change overnight, but we can give them an opportunity to do so. And so Limiting your contact with these types of quote unquote friends when you're tired and struggling and having, you know, you don't need to light yourself on fire to keep them warm. Maybe to start taking notice of like, what would be the boundaries we wish were in place? What would be, you know, the dynamics of a relationship that we wish we had? Can we go out looking for that? Can we communicate that to one of our friends? Can we change a subject and try to have space for our issues too? We can do all of those things and then see where we're at because you're not doing anything wrong. You're not causing this. We just selected people on in like the flip side of what we are because we're used to that. And it was comfortable, but now it's become uncomfortable. And so we have to, you know, try to change it, shake it up and find other people who can share what's going on with them, but also care to ask us what's going on with us too. And truly listen and take your time with this. We all, like I said, this applies to everybody. Like even for me, my people pleasing behaviors I didn't become aware of until I was in my mid 20s. And I had tons of friendships that had to end as a result of that because I started shifting and they became agitated. And then it didn't work the way it used to work. And hey, how come you're not doing that? You know, and I couldn't be that person anymore. And for all the relationships that ended, all except for one, there was no like big fight. It was just, we just grew apart and it's okay. And that makes space for other better relationships. Okay, so hang in there. Let's move on to question number two. This question says, hey, Katie, I asked this question last week, but unfortunately it wasn't picked. So I'll ask again, ask as many times as you need. I try to get through as many of them as I can. It says, why is it that someone who has experienced trauma, AKA me, might continue to feel overwhelmed by the emotions of it all when alone in the evenings, even when there is no threat or trigger that I can find? I normally distract myself a lot, but when, but then just end up not dealing with anything. I'm either all or nothing. And P.S. Due to circumstances, I'm currently not having sessions with my counselor. 
Sorry, I hope this makes sense. No need to apologize. You make perfect sense. The reason we feel the worst at night is because we don't have the as many options for distractions, especially if we're lying in bed trying to go to sleep. Guess what? All of that suppressed anger, upset, whatever it is we're experiencing comes up, rears its ugly head, and upsets us, causes us to feel overwhelmed. We can dissociate. We can feel anxious. We can have panic attacks. We can struggle to sleep. When we sleep, we can have like panic-based dreams. It's because you're only distracting and you're not feeling anything. You're not processing anything. And there is a question here at the end about how we feel our feelings, how we actually move through it instead of just distract. So stay tuned for that. But that's why you feel overwhelmed by it at night because you're never letting yourself experience it during the day. Distractions are helpful. Here's a key thing to remember. Distractions are helpful in the moment to get us through. I like to think of distractions as kind of these techniques to take the edge off so that then we can do some more process-based coping skills. Things like talking to our friend, therapist, journaling, doing an impulse log, more of those things that help us acknowledge how we feel and move through it. Distractions just like lower the intensity of our anxiety or uh, trauma triggers or flashbacks or urge to dissociate. They bring that down enough so we can engage in those more difficult process-based ones. That's why you're distracting all day, but you never do the process-based. And then at night, your brain's like, hello, here's all the stuff you didn't deal with. And so you're not all or nothing. It's just you're distracting. You're not giving yourself an opportunity to move through it. So it's like building up. And so the final question on today's episode, I'll talk specifically about feeling those feelings, but some process-based coping skills, like I said, like journaling, talking to a friend. I know you're not seeing your counselor, but when you get back to seeing them, talk to them. Um, Impulse logs. Impulse logs are essentially when we feel like an impulse to distract, to self-harm, to use eating disorder behavior, suicidal thoughts, whatever. We have to slow down, acknowledge when it's happening, what day, what time, what is the emotion that I'm trying to distract from? What's the experience? What is it that I could do instead that might be more helpful for me? How do I feel now? And then you pretty much get permission to kind of engage in whatever it was your your impulse was after you've done that. But that just slows it down to kind of help you recognize what it is you're experiencing, what you're really feeling, and what's the impulse urge. Where do we think that's coming from? It just gives us a chance to kind of slow down. And instead of just engaging in the impulsive behavior, we try to understand it and what we're maybe, what we could express that's more healthy instead. Like, for example, if I'm feeling alone and that makes me feel really sad and I feel really isolated and I feel misunderstood, if I can acknowledge that rather than self injuring, then that's a move in the right direction because then at least I can recognize, hey, loneliness is actually a trigger for me. So maybe I need to make more of, you know, make more of an effort to connect with my friends or to make friends or to engage with other people. Or maybe I need to do a group therapy thing. Like it gives us an idea of what our triggers are and how we can better manage. Now, there was a comment on this that said, as an add-on, I'm not sure if this is related, but I noticed that I use my phone excessively lately especially since I stopped purging. I have a history of emotional neglect and partly abuse and traumatizing friendships and their endings. And I'm trying to cope by, am I trying to cope by using my phone? How can I stop numbing out? It's exactly what you're doing. You're numbing out. It's that distraction. And the way to stop doing that is to slowly start incorporating some of those process-based coping skills. Now in my video, if you just go onto YouTube and do 25 coping skills, Katie Morton, it will pop up. In there, I have half distraction-based coping skills, half process-based coping skills. And I encourage you, it's okay to distract for a bit to take the edge off, but then we have to tap in and we have to do some of those process-based ones, some of those more moving us through the emotion rather than trying to get us to forget it exists. And so your phone is a way of numbing out. It is a way of distracting. And it's okay to do that a little bit, but I want you to then, after distracting for maybe 10, 20, maximum of 30 minutes, I want you to try a process-based coping skill. If you find it overwhelming, we distract a little, then we go back to the process so that we don't feel like we're just stockpiling all this emotion, okay? 
Moving on to question number three, this question says, hi, Katie, I know you mentioned before that you were starting your own IFS, that stands for Internal Family Systems, work, and I was wondering your thoughts on it so far, if you're okay with sharing. I'm totally okay with sharing. I actually have a video I posted about parts work recently, probably a couple of months old now at this point, but you can find it on YouTube. Um, I'll try to remember to link it in the description, but you can just do parts work Katie Morton on YouTube and it will pop up. I started with my own therapist about two months ago, and I really struggled to take it seriously, I feel you, and let go enough for it to be effective. I can't seem to imagine the different versions of me, and the talking to little me part seems so juvenile and awkward that I feel like I don't take it seriously, and it isn't really effective. The catch is, I am people-pleasing my way through it. I'm just playing along with what my therapist said, and I feel like I'm gaslighting her into believing that it's helping. I feel like my issue is that I just can't let go and actually let it help because I feel so silly. Just wondering if you ever ran into this and if you had any suggestions on navigating this because I truly want it to work. Thanks for all you do. You rock. And sorry for the repost. Always repost. It's okay. Lots of thoughts. Internal family systems, for those of you who don't know, is often... It's a style of therapy where it includes what's called parts work. And parts work is the belief that we have different versions slash parts of ourselves that exist. And some are like exiled, meaning we don't talk to them. They're not listened to. They aren't respected. They like don't get to take up space. And then we have protector parts. And there are different parts within ourselves. And they all really serve a purpose But when we're struggling with some dysfunction in our life, certain parts are exiled. Some are protectors. They get in the place kind of in the way of us being vulnerable and open because they're there to protect. And so when we're having a tough time, some parts aren't heard from. Some parts aren't respected. Sometimes there's too much protector, too many protector parts so that we can't express how we feel. And so there's some dysfunction within the parts. Okay. I don't know if that's going to make sense, but just hang with me. I will talk through my process and hopefully that helps. Now, yes, I ran into the silliness because the biggest hurdle to overcome for me when I was doing parts work is to actually play along with it. Like I'm very literal. I'm very, I'm too adult, right? I'm overly responsible. I'm type A. And so that makes it hard for me to like play pretend, which is kind of what this felt like at the beginning, because I have to create this meeting place and I have to show up at the meeting place with all of my parts and and tell my therapist who's there. And at the beginning, it felt really woo-woo and really ridiculous. And I felt kind of stupid doing it. But I pushed through. And my therapist explained to me that this reluctance, this like, oh, it feels kind of stupid. It feels silly. It's embarrassing. This feels woo-woo is kind of the protector portion of me. It's a protector part that has come up. And the reason that it's a protector part is because if we think it's silly and we don't really engage, then we don't have to acknowledge the pain that we feel. So it's protecting us from the pain and the upset. So it's okay. It's okay to acknowledge, hey, this feels silly. It's okay to tell your therapist, I feel kind of weird doing this. It feels kind of childlike. I feel kind of stupid or whatever, whatever it is you feel. It's okay to acknowledge that because what we call, I like what I've come to call this part of myself, this piece, this protector is like the bouncer at this cafe. My, my meeting place is a cafe. So it's like a bouncer at the front that's like checking or like a, a security guard. And she stands there and she's like, oh, you guys are so, like she makes fun of things and she tries to stop me from getting in. And she just tries to keep me from doing that tough work because it's hard and it makes me want to cry, right? And so acknowledging that difficulty is part of the work. Once I got past that big hurdle, which I'm not pretending it was easy, it took me quite a few sessions. Once I got past that, I really have found it effective. And the reason I found it effective isn't that I really had to get woo-woo with it and imagine these different pieces of me, but it allowed me to see the parts of myself that I don't talk to, that I've like exiled, to use an IFS term, and how that is harming me now. For example, in my work, my number one part that I don't listen to is teenage me. And the reason I don't listen to her is because she's too emotional. She's always like throwing a tantrum. Everything's a big deal. She is really impulsive. She feels kind of out of control to me. But what I've realized through my work is that that's not really who she is. Who she is is she's the emotional Sherpa for my whole system. 
She's the one that comes to the table with all of the feelings that I experience and is like, bleh, here it is. So she's kind of messy. And type A perfectionistic part of me is like, "Mm -mm, I don't want mess in here. You get out. You don't belong here. We don't want to listen to you. You're making a, oh, you're making everything more complicated. But what I've realized is that when I don't listen to her, a lot of bad things happen because the system is balanced with each piece, right? And I have tons of different parts. That's not the only one, but that's one of my exile parts that I've been trying to incorporate. And without listening to her, I have found myself feeling more depressed, feeling more anxious, being more tearful when I don't want to, like at inappropriate times and, you know, for me. I've also found myself like not having any fun, not enjoying things, hence depression, right? And wanting to be, then there's like, instead of being able to engage with her in a healthy way, I want to do this all or nothing, like impulse or not do anything at all. It's that black or white thinking. It pushes me into that. And and then I also just feel overwhelmed with emotion because I'm not allowing myself to experience it, right? If she's the emotional Sherpa and I'm ignoring her, then no emotions are brought to the table. And so engaging with her doesn't look like me be allowing for emotions immediately and like feeling overwhelmed by them. It started with me allowing myself to take some time off and to play, to have fun, to do goofy things, to find ways to incorporate the stuff she wants. Cause she's very bossy and very pushy and she knows exactly what she wants, but a lot of the things she wants, I can't do anything about right now. So I have to figure out what, how do I listen to her while still respecting the fact that I have a life to live. Like I can't like move back to Santa Monica today, which is what she wants me to do. I, it's going to take some time. And so I have to engage with her in a way that feels better and isn't so quite so impulsive and blows, blows my life up. Right. And so all this to say, and I, there, like I said, I have a full video if you want to know more because, you know, there is a lot to it, but I love it. I find it really helpful. I was surprised how emotional I got in the process, but I want you to know that that first hurdle is really just like your bouncer. It's really just your protector. And I don't think there's anybody out there who's engaged in this. Maybe if you're more of a free thinker, don't have trouble with like playing pretend and imaginary. But for most of us, I think we do. And it's very normal for us to feel like, oh, this is weird and uncomfortable. And I still feel that sometimes. And it's usually because I have an emotional experience or a part that really needs to speak up and I'm scared about it. And so I tell my therapist, ooh, I'm having a tough time going to the meeting place. It's like, I don't want to. Like it doesn't want, my my, like bouncer doesn't want to let me in. And that usually it means there's work to be done. So I know that's not really like a perfect answer. Everybody's experience is going to be different. And everybody's going to have different parts. Like I have a childlike part of me. She's more like the peacekeeper. I have the adult part of me where she like gets shit done. She's exhausted. There's therapist part of me. There's like teen me. Like I said, there's party fun Katie. She's always wants to have a good time. And then there's competitive me. Um, And I think those are all the parts just off the top of my head. And then bouncer. Like then there's the protector part that like doesn't let things, you know, doesn't let people in. So it'd be interesting to hear what your parts are and to see who shows up because different parts show up at different times. And sometimes not all of them are in the meeting place. Just depends on what I'm talking about. But getting over that kind of hurdle of the like woo-woo-ness is a part of the process. So just lean into it. Let your therapist know that's not you doing it incorrectly. That's actually you doing it the way it's supposed to be done. It just feels a little weird up front and it's, it's protective. Okay. So hang in there. I found it to be really effective. It did take me a little while to get over that. So it's okay. And sometimes it's hard again. And again, it's it's because it's protecting. Just acknowledging that it's protecting you helps me. Like if I realize it's difficult and I feel like I'm walking up to my meeting place, I see my bouncer and I'm like, ooh. And so I have to acknowledge her. I have to be like, I understand your role, but it's okay. I can go in. I'm going to be okay. And you're here if I need you, you know? Again, I know it's woo-woo, but hang with me, hang with your therapist. It does get better. And I find it to be incredibly helpful. Okay. Moving on to question number four, this question says, hi, Katie, do you know what I can do to get out of a depressive episode or at least make sure it doesn't happen at certain times? 
This may sound very stupid and maybe there's nothing I can do, but I've struggled with these episodes for almost a year now. And only in the last few months have they become so recent that they scare me. I have some lows. I have more lows than good times. And even in my good times, a tiny thing can disrupt me and send me straight back to my low. Each time it gets worse and worse and I feel like something bad is about to happen if I don't do something. Like I'm going to kill myself or have so little energy that one day I won't be able to get up. But sometimes I really can't have those episodes when people can judge me or I'm in a vulnerable or dangerous situation. I want to try and stay safe somehow till I'm in a better place. Is there anything that I can do? Have a nice day and I hope you know something that I don't. Okay, I'm going to give you a bunch of different options because there are different ways we can address this. First of all, I'm proud of you for speaking up and reaching out. I'm so sorry you're going through this. Depression can be so heavy, so exhausting. And my first tip, see a psychiatrist. And I know some people will be like, but medication doesn't fix anything. Hey, if it'll take the edge off so that we can actually do the work in therapy, it's amazing. And that's what I'm here for. And so I would encourage you to see a psychiatrist, let them know of the symptoms that are bothering you. Like, hey, sometimes I have suicidal thoughts. I feel really exhausted. I can't sleep very well. It's hard for me to enjoy anything, whatever the list is. And consider taking a medication. Ask all the questions about side effects and, you know, what, what you need to look out for, make sure that you let them know what you're experiencing and track your symptoms for the next few weeks to make sure that that medication is actually working for you and not just doing nothing, right? So that's my first tip. Talk to a doctor. Here are some things that we can do to kind of biohack our way through it, meaning we can kind of force our brain into releasing more serotonin and dopamine by doing specific things, Okay. And some of these you're going to like, some of these you're not. It's okay. Just try the things that you like and give it a go. Number one, and the best thing I find is to get outside, face in the sun with early. Like when you wake up, like put on your robe or put on some pajamas, cover, like put on a sweatshirt and step outside. Get that sun on your face. If it's cloudy all the time where you live and it's dark, whenever you get up and it's dark when you come home and you feel like you never see the sun, get yourself a UV light. They call them seasonal affective disorder lights or sad lights. I have one linked in my Amazon shop. You can go to amazon.com forward slash shop forward slash Katie Morton. There's one in there. You want to make sure that they're actually made for this. And I want you to get up and I want you to just close your eyes and let the sun hit you in the face. And I want you to do that for 15 minutes. Okay. Um, If you can do it for longer, awesome. But you're supposed to, they say, within 30 minutes of waking, get some sun on your face. Now, if you have windows in your bathroom like I do, sometimes I just sit there and let the sun hit my face. The windows are not UV protected. It's important that they're not. I know that sounds weird. I'm not advocating for skin cancer or anything like that, but we do need that sun on our face. Vitamin D, if you didn't realize, affects our mood drastically. If we have really low vitamin D, it can like mimic symptoms of depression. And sun on our face actually helps us produce vitamin D. So it's important, okay? Number one biohack. Number two, dunking your face in cold water. Fill up your sink with cold water or put a bowl filled with ice and water and let it sit for a minute, let it get cold. And I want you to dunk your face in there and don't fill the water too high or the water will go out of the bowl. Just FYI, give it space for your face to go in. Okay, like half full. (laughs) And the reason that we do this is it not only is cold water activating to our nervous system, it's also anti-inflammatory. So if you have puffy face, it helps too but it triggers what's known as the diving reflex. And the diving reflex is that, you know, that urge to go, (gasps) like when we dunk our face under, that triggers our vagus nerve, magic. And our vagus nerve can help improve our mood. That's why a lot of people do vagus nerve stimulation stuff, like gently rubbing this area, swallowing. Um, We can do some massage stuff. We can do, I have a whole video about vagus nerve stimulation if you want to watch that. But there's a lot of different things that we can do. That diving reflex thing triggers it and that can help you feel better. And I also find the cold water to be really refreshing and it helps kind of like jostle me out of whatever funk I'm in. That's a good one. Another one, movement. If you can stretch or walk for 15 minutes, you will feel the difference. Ideally, it's after you eat because moving, it helps move our digestion along. It also helps like lower the spike in our cortisol and in our uh, blood sugars. And it can help us feel less stressed in our life and overall better for our health, less 
likelihood, I guess, of diabetes. Um, moving your body is good. And I find stretching to be really helpful too. So if you're not feeling extremely motivated, or if it's really, really cold where you are, walk around your house or apartment a little bit and then maybe stretch, you know, do some of these things, touch your toes if you can, do some stretches, maybe put on some nice music too. Those are some of the ways that we can feel better. It helps improve our mood, helps release serotonin and dopamine. Those are good things. Also, basic needs. We need to build up that resilience. This is my last little tip. Things like drinking water. We shouldn't get up and have a big cup of coffee without anything in our stomach. This actually spikes our cortisol, makes us really stressed out. Drink a glass of water. Make sure you eat protein in the morning for if you, you know, vegan, vegetarian, regular, it doesn't matter. You can have eggs. You can have peanut butter on toast. You can have whatever, yogurt, non-dairy yogurt. I don't care. But eating something in the morning, eating regularly every three to four hours so that you have energy because that lethargy can make our mood feel bad and we can go through these blood sugar ups and downs. And that's why protein is important because it keeps it more stable. There's just a lot of ways that we can help ourselves, like set ourselves up for success. Things like getting enough sleep, which I know is hard when we're not feeling well, but I'm just telling you a shower can fucking change your life sometimes. So make time for that. And those are all some things that we can do. Take your medication as prescribed. Make sure that you connect with someone who truly gets you. Do you have a friend, a sibling, a parent who is loving and caring and actually knows you? We should reach out to them. If we're looking for more connection, our community is a great place in the comments or an even safer place is probably within YouTube memberships or Patreon. You can join Patreon for just a dollar a month. You can join YouTube memberships starting at $5 a month. Those are just ways to engage in maybe a safer community. We also have a Facebook group. If you go over to my Facebook page, the Katie group is there for some peer support. Those are all some ways to get connected, but hang in there. I honestly think medication is going to be the best and therapy, obviously therapy. Um, BetterHelp is a, is a great resource. I've partnered with them over the years. You can use the link in any of the descriptions of my videos to access it and it gives you a discount on your first month. So you can do anything from just texting with a therapist to actual video sessions. It depends on your budget, but they really work with you and that could be really helpful as well. I hope that that helps. Hang in there. I Hopefully some of these things are new to you. Hopefully some of them are things you hadn't thought of, but let's, let's biohack our way, build up our resilience so that we don't feel so bad all the time. Okay, let's move on to question number five. This question is, hey, Katie, I was wondering if you could talk about codependency in friendships. Thank you, you're amazing. Okay, now an important thing to remember is that a codependency in friendships is really like an unequal relationship. This means that one friend completely relies on the other for support and validation, okay? I know we use terms a lot and we don't always understand, but the person who's giving of this emotional support and validation, so the giver, which I'd assume is probably the person who asked this question, but maybe not. But we can take responsibility or feel the need to take the responsibility of the other person and feel like we are we have to fix their problems. We're the one that needs to solve things for them. We need to take care of them. It can be almost like a, a parent-child dynamic even though we're friends, okay? And the taker, the person who is taking all of this may feel like they need that support from the person who's giving. Otherwise, they won't, they can't do it on their own. They feel like insufficient or uh, not enough on their own. And this can cause a lot of anxiety in the relationship and cause a lot of stress. It can make it feel like it's unequal. It's not balanced, right? One person's always giving, one person's always taking. And so the giver can feel emotionally exhausted, want to pull away. And however you look at this, it's not a healthy dynamic. It's incredibly common. And a lot of times, you know, I was talking about earlier how we get this blueprint from our parents about like what relationships look like and we can be drawn to those exact types of relationships because it's what we know and it's comfortable. That can be why we are drawn to codependent relationships, especially if we grew up in a home where there was some kind of addiction. That can cause us to be codependent. We can feel like we need to fix that person, like the parent who is an addict. We can feel like we have to fix them. We're responsible for them. We can be a parentified child. So then we go out into the world and we look for other people who will need our kind of fixing abilities is just like the first question here where the person said that people are like trauma dumping and always talking to them about things and they're like, oh, I'm so exhausted. That's the same with codependency. 
We might have these types of dynamics in our relationships because that's what we knew growing up. And so in order to kind of undo this, we're going to have to acknowledge how it's showing up and start changing our behavior little by little. I encourage you to communicate with your friends that you've noticed that you tend to like overexert yourself, people please, or be too much of a giver in your relationships. And so you're trying to set up some healthy boundaries and limitations so you don't feel so worn out. Let them know that you're going to shift your behavior. Give them an opportunity to meet you where you're at. I know a lot of people are like, oh, cut off people and, you know, we should, they're toxic and we should end that relationship. Maybe, but maybe not. I'm always surprised by people's ability to rise to the occasion. Let's give them an opportunity to do it. If they don't, then we get to decide whether we want to continue that relationship or not. But let's at least tell them, hey, I'm trying to do this thing. Hey, I noticed that I tend to get myself in these situations. Like even one of my closest friends, Rocio, has told me time and time again, she's like, I tend to double book myself. And then I'm like, oh, she goes, because I don't want to let anybody down. And so whenever we're making plans, a couple days before I ask her, I'm like, hey, did you feel pressure to double book? Because I can reschedule with you. And she'll let me know. She hasn't done it as much anymore, but she used to. And I would just allow her to reschedule because I knew she was trying to not do that to herself. And I didn't want to be spending time with her knowing she's stressed out, right? So give people a chance to support you and to encourage the changes in behavior you're trying to make. And if they can't hang, then we get to decide what's best. But unfortunately, codependency happens in all relationships. It's not only romantic or fa familial relationships. It can also happen in our friendships. Now, there was a comment on this that said, as an add-on, I have emotional walls through my emotional neglect childhood, and there are only two friends that I could truly open up to about it. Both friendships immediately felt close, although it usually takes me a while to build trust. Both friendships ended with lots of heated arguments, and I feel like I connected unhealthily and in a toxic way. How did that happen, and how can it, how can it stop? Oh, why did that happen, and how can it stop? Sorry. Oftentimes, when we grow up with emotional neglect, we have attachment issues. And unfortunately, when we run into people who are similar to our past, they can feel really, really comfortable. And so we attach quickly. When we're normally avoidant, we can find ourselves anxiously attaching in those situations. And so as just kind of a, a red flag for all of us to be aware of, if you find yourself normally engaging in a healthier way. I wouldn't say this is healthier. It's like all or nothing. We're either like it takes us a long time to connect or we connect right away. I'd argue there's a middle ground there and we probably need to work on our attachment. And I'll talk about that a little bit. But if you find yourself all of a sudden, like I'm so drawn to this person. Oh my God, they're amazing. I want to tell them everything. We find ourselves oversharing. Maybe the relationship moves quickly, whether it's a friendship or romantic relationship, it's moving much faster than others. That is a huge red flag. I encourage you to pause because when things move really quickly, it's usually indicative of an old unhealthy pattern. That rut in our brain for that type of dynamic and that type of connection is well-worn. And even though we've been trying to not engage in that, when we come across a person who's similar to, let's say, I don't know, our old abusive ex or our mom or our dad or just the way that our family was. They remind us of our brother or our father. We just couldn't move fast enough. Feel so comfortable. Oh my God, I, I, they really get me. I just feel so comfortable with them. I could share them. I share everything with them. If we come from, if we have abuse in our past or come from unhealthy dynamics, which I think most of us do in one way or another, that's not a good sign. And I know that answer is shitty. I heard it from my own therapist that I had this pattern of dating guys that were just like total dicks and unavailable. And she was like, I kind of want you to be uncomfortable in your next relationship. And I was like, how dare you? But she was right. I needed to. I needed to change that pattern. If I felt really drawn, like, oh my God, this is going to be amazing. That was a bad sign. That's a red flag. Ah, I proceed with caution. And so back to this question, I believe that you felt close to your, those friends really, really quickly because they reminded you of probably something that happened in your childhood, probably a parent. I would argue they possibly were emotionally neglectful in their own way. It might have looked a little different, but internally it felt the same. And so my encouragement for you is to, I don't know if you're in therapy, but talk to your therapist about it if you are. If not, 
I have an attachment-based workshop and an inner child workshop, both available on my website at katiemorton.com. You can go to the shop and find them there. Check those out. I think both of those can be incredibly beneficial. I also have videos for free available on YouTube. You can look up attachment Katie Morton or inner child Katie Morton. Whenever a workshop comes out, I don't know if you guys have noticed this, I have a few videos that will come out with it to make it accessible to everybody. I know not everybody can spend like 20 bucks on something or 30 bucks on a workshop. And so there's some free content out there too. I would encourage you to dive into those worlds, attachment and inner child stuff, because when we have emotional neglect in our childhood, unfortunately, that comes along with patterns of behavior. And when we want to change those patterns, you already are recognizing them. So we have to acknowledge them. And then we have to find other ways of acting. And, and all those workshops help build uh, build secure attachment and also heal our inner child so that we don't act out of that anymore. Okay. I hope that helps. Final question, question number six says, hey, Katie, everyone keeps telling me that it's important to, quote unquote, feel my feelings and acknowledge my grief. I had an accident, so grieving the life that I won't have now, but I don't understand how to or what that really means. Could you explain how I can try to move on with my life and feel these emotions? I get overwhelmed and depressed thinking about the future, but it's like it builds up inside of me until I can't take it anymore and I completely fall apart. How can I just feel emotions normally? This is a great question. And to be honest, feeling emotions isn't something that a lot of us were taught, especially because most of our parents didn't know how either and they just pass on what they knew and they, right, they can't show us a depth that they don't have themselves. And so let me walk you through some tips and tricks on how to actually feel your feelings. And the first piece, and I know this might seem like kind of counterintuitive, but is to start to get a look at the feelings wheel, go to feelingswheel.com. Check it out, print it out, write out, let's say 20 different feelings off of that wheel and just write them or jot them down in a doc on your computer. And I want you to consider how you would define those. I don't want you Googling. We don't need to know the actual definition. I want to know how you define a feeling. And, you know, you can start in the middle, the feelings wheel the middle, the ones in the very middle of the wheel are more of our like core emotions. I forget the word they use. I don't know if it's primary or secondary. I always think of it as like core emotions. They're like bigger. They're almost like inside out where it's like anger, you know, uh, sadness. So those might be easier or you might find the ones as you work your way out to be easier. It just depends. But those ones tend to get more detailed. And so if we're just starting out, sometimes those inner ones are the easiest to start with. So Write down some emotions from that wheel and tell me what they, what, what are they? How would you define it? Take your time with this. It might be really, really hard. We might never have thought about it before. If you find yourself having a really tough time and getting stuck, you can watch a movie or a TV show. And when someone's expressing something, which is often common, especially reality TV, I I know that not everybody likes that. I personally don't really watch it, but put on an episode of reality TV, especially like Housewives, Kardashians, and anger, frustration, you know, all of that is going to come up. And I want you to watch it. Tell me how you know what emotion they're expressing. And then tell me what it looks like. You know, that can be a way for us to kind of better define it. Okay. So anyway, start with those and start considering what how you would define them. And then after that, after we start to feel a little bit more comfortable and we can pick more emotions and we can easily define them, we're just feeling a little bit better about it. Next is I want you to start to understand where you feel it in your body. When I'm angry, what is happening? And this might be hard, especially if we have any trauma in our past. It might be really hard to feel it in our body, but let's take a minute to consider. Like if I'm really angry, do I clench my jaw? Is this tight? Are my Do I make fists? What do I do? Are my muscles tense everywhere? Do I find myself sitting up straight? Or am I curled over when I feel kind of sad? Just start to pay attention to the things happening in your body and pick, you know, with this, just pick a couple, see how it goes and build from there. And the goal of all of this is because we think about like, oh, I have to feel my feelings. Okay, I'm gonna try to feel them now. That's not how it works. I want you to get to know them. I want you to be able to identify them because that is a huge step in the right direction. So once we've started to better understand them, how do we, what, how do we name them? What are they? How do we define them? Okay. How do I feel? Where do I feel it in my body? Then after we know that, when we know 
what we feel in our body when we're angry, when we're sad, when we're excited. That is such helpful information in this process. Then going back to the question, how can I feel these emotions? How do I try to move on with my life, right? And feel these emotions. Then when we start noticing those things in our bodies, right? Let's say my fist starts to clench. I feel tightness. I find myself sitting up straight. Maybe I'm angry. Huh. I think I'm angry. Now, to express it, it depends. We could put on some angry music and we can kind of like kick it out, punch, move around. We can journal. We can write letters we don't send to people. We can write really angry letters. Doesn't make it, I don't care if they make sense. I don't care if they're spelled correctly. We can just jot down really angrily the things that we're thinking. We can, you know, do any kind of movement, whether it's a mental movement by journaling, talking about it with someone venting we can just like scream in our car to like some really angry music or if it's through our body where we kick and we move or we walk or we do whatever we can do whatever it is to help feel that that's us feeling it acknowledging it expressing it and then you'll notice that that feeling comes and it goes it feels like feelings are going to wash us out to sea like they're so intense if i finally allow myself to feel happy sad mad whatever it's just going to be too much It might feel like a lot at first, but I'm here to tell you that they come and go like waves. I can feel angry and I'll feel angry for a little bit and it goes away. Sometimes it'll go away in a couple minutes. Sometimes it'll last for an hour, but it moves on. And it only lasts for days and days and weeks and weeks and months and months if we don't allow it, if we don't experience it, if we don't acknowledge it, right? I'm frustrated. I'm exhausted. I'm We have to allow ourselves to feel it and express it. And that's why journaling every morning is incredibly helpful. I know it's not for everybody, but there's a book that I've used. It's a little workbook called uh, Live Big. Rochelle, somebody is the author. It's like a black book with colorful letters. It's on Amazon. I encourage you to pick that up or pick up a journal prompt or join my Inkwell Club on on YouTube memberships for $4.99 a month. You get journal prompts every Tuesday and Friday at, I believe it's like, two o'clock Central Standard Time, so like noon Pacific and three o'clock Eastern, you get two journal prompts a week. So that can help you write too. You can write on those for a little bit to get you going. So utilize some of that. Therapy can also help with that expression. Also group therapy, individual, any kind of thing like that can be beneficial. But that's really how we allow ourselves to feel things. And it's normal to not know how. So don't think anything's wrong with you. I think it's really, really common. I actually have a full video coming out about this and I'll walk you through in more detail on how to feel those feelings, but it's something that a lot of us struggle with. So I hope that helps get you started. Okay. I hope you found that helpful. Thank you all so much for watching and listening. I really appreciate it. If you share this podcast, that really, really helps. Have a wonderful rest of your week, do your homework, and I'll see you next time.